This is Henry Chamberlain, and I have the honor of uh, chatting with Martin Olson, author of The Conquest of Heaven, which is the sequel to uh, The Encyclopedia of Hell. Martin, I just want to ask you, well, first, I want to thank you for, for doing this interview. Well, the honor is mine. I'm a big fan of your work. It's good well, to see you, man. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you to, to be, I got two questions. Let's start with uh, uh, tell us about about Satan. Where where to begin? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a comedy writer, right? Yeah, so I'm not yeah. a I'm not a you know an artist, <clears throat> and a, I'm not co comic based. Although I have written, you know, maybe a dozen comics or and um, through the years. But um, as a comedy writer, if you have the voice of Satan in your book as the narrator all bets are off because you don't have to worry about being too bombastic or saying the wrong thing so i was very fortunate <clears throat> excuse me now that um you know now that uh, there's a great sensitivity happening in the younger generations in terms of what can be said and what can't be said which is just a normal evolutionary blip about comedy <clears throat> Um, that if you have the voice of Satan, your all bets are off. You yeah. can say anything. You know what I mean? And you don't have to worry about it. Look, it's Satan, the evil guy, responsible for everything we don't like. So that's uh, the point of view <clears throat> of both of the books. So first there was Encyclopedia of Hell. And then the sequel is The Conquest of Heaven. Now, people uh, will talk about... Uh... Ambrose Spears yeah. and Mark Twain to make a yeah. connection with your book. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Do you uh, feel that connection or is there some other author that comes to mind or, or just I'll let you jump in with that? No, you just named the, that's what, that's what I was aiming at was a literary satire, you know, and Ambrose Beers, one of the sickest writers in the world <laughs> <laughs> with his short stories, I mean. <clears throat> he would take on a voice of someone who's mentally ill, basically, and who's has an unexpected, like Poe would as well. The, the speakers, it's an unreliable narrator. And uh, Twain, like, for example, with The Mysterious Stranger, one of his most amazing books, it's all about Satan, you know? And he wrote a lot about satires of biblical stuff, of Western religion. <clears throat> Excuse me, the undertone being the undercurrent being that all religions are made up, you know, but it's, it's rude to, to be one of these guys that always just points that out to people because most of the world is, has religious beliefs, you know? Yeah. So it isn't really, it's just kind of immature to, to keep pointing that out <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> that it's all made up because the bottom line is that the whole nature of our existence is spiritual. It's just that, that the religious views are made up all these rules and laws and these guys all the all the prophets are made are some of them didn't even exist so <clears throat> the point is just that the underpinnings of our reality is a spiritual thing we don't even know why we're here or what is what is all this about i mean it all evolved from nothingness so that's uh th th those are ideas that i'm ex that i explore in these books in a satirical way. The first book is about <clears throat> Encyclopedia of Hell, which I lucked out. I mean, it became super popular. I sold the film rights to Warner Brothers and uh, <clears throat> had suddenly a zillion fans on the internet. Um, that book is where hell is overcrowded. And so Satan, attacks earth for the land space and uses humans as foodstuffs for his armies and the uh, humankind is wiped out that's the humorous premise of this first book <laughs> and the second book is when they're on earth they satan who doesn't remember because he's been alive forever <clears throat> he um, hears the mythos and the legends on earth about a God, a creator. 
And so Satan realizes he was, there's a gap in his memory. He doesn't know where he came from, how he got here. He just knows that he created hell and demons and everything out of the fabric of his mind. All of that he created out of his imagination. So he knows the stuff of the universe is thought-based, <clears throat> but he never thought that he was created. You know, he probably blocked that thought. So being confronted with it, with humanity, the legends of God, he searches out throughout of the out of existence and out of the cosmos God's location and the location of heaven. <clears throat> the book is about his solo mission to go there, attack heaven, and kill God. So and that's the, those that those, that's the basic plot of those two books. Well, that's perfect. I, I wanted to just let you uh, do a nice full description. I, yeah. I have some interesting questions for you, some fun questions, I hope. We were talking about that just before we, we jumped into the actual interview. I, I'm kind of thinking that there's two ways of, of doing Satan. Uh, you can do him as a dark satire, or you can do him where it's scary, spooky. Uh, one of my favorite books, I, I don't know if, you, if you've ever read... Uh, the Case Against Satan by Ray Russell. If you, you know, haven't I've heard of that, though, tell me about it. Oh my <laughs> God, it's like uh, The Exorcist, but even more down to earth. So it's it's creepier because it's it's very very believable, and it's like uh, the the demon. You, you don't see him very. It, there's not much of the demon in the story. It's, it's how the people react to the demon, and <laughs> really, just, it really it, just, it gets under your skin. So yeah, I would the I would definitely look that up. It's the case against Satan, is that the, it? The case against Satan, uh, Ray Russell. Ray Russell. Ray Russell is a, is a well-known author. I got to get that, man. I'm glad you told me. Let me just write it down. <clears throat> I didn't get a chance. I, I don't believe there's a movie made of it. There, there should be. I'm going to check that out. Thanks. Hey, I like your cup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie Freeze. <laughs> Everything's cartoon related. Um. <clears throat> <clears throat> so well, you were asking about those two yeah so so, so you've got something like ray russell where, where it, it it crawls under your skin at mark twain i would think the mysterious stranger is in that vein but then uh, a humane letter from satan is more in the dark satire category where it's 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 whimsical and uh, it's a a proposition well i'm i'm satan and i i'm very uh, uh philanthropic you know what you should let rockefeller in it's just <laughs> hilarious <laughs> really it's like that yeah <clears throat> so uh could you talk about that you the, the voice of your satan i would think of, of him more as as for laughs but but he is he's definitely satan so but he's not a creepy yeah. it's not like he gets under your skin type or or is he am i reading that wrong well th there's two things about um about a comedy writer picking Satan as the, the voice for a book, for a story. <clears throat> Excuse me. One is what I said before that all bets are off so you can be as a bombastic and, a, and uh, confrontative and uh, insulting and irreverent and, and say the wrong thing and it's okay. I mean, that's a yeah. big freedom you have when you do that because the audience knows that it's Satan talking. <clears throat> but the other part of it is um, I, I was a big fan of the science fiction writer when I was a boy, Robert Sheckley, who was a yeah. very funny writer. And he and I eventually, through crazy ch chance encounters, became writing partners. Oh, really? It was death. <clears throat> we wrote a novel together. We wrote sh a short story. We wrote a video game together. We wrote two. We wrote a TV show for Monsters, one of the of an anthology, and we wrote. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't know if I said video game. We did that as well. At any rate, early on, because I, I would fly up to visit him and we'd work and he'd come down and fly down and stay with my wife and me. And I, I said, Bob, what is the essence of your work? What's your whole attitude? He said, it's simple. He says, um, the phrase that I use all the time and how I construct stories is sympathy with all things. So that means that even if you have a bad guy like Satan, 
I mean, he still might have a toothache someday. You know, his aunt might die. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's just the humanizing and the empathy with any sentient being. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, I'm so congested. And so that has become a, a keynote in, in, in terms of my comedy writing. So it's humanizing even the most unspeakable things. That makes sense. Well, Mind Swap is one of my favorite novels. Mine too, and it's Rudy Rucker's favorite book too, the science fiction Rudy Rucker. Okay. What's the novel that you did with, with uh, Shackley? Um, it's a, he had <clears throat> abandoned a novel and uh, needless to say, as a fan, and he and I were, were actually working tangibly and making money on various projects. And all we would do is just howl laughing smoking cigarettes and drinking and smoking pot and fucking howling, laughing. I mean, that was the main part of our relationship. And mm -hmm. that then we, we always record everything. So I have all the recordings of our sessions, which has been useful for some of the projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the novel was <clears throat> one that he had abandoned <clears throat> called On the Good Ship Mandelbrot. And it was about a gigantic spaceship in which an entire race uh, leaves their home planet in search of one suitable to start over again and the pl the <clears throat> ship <clears throat> excuse me the ship has a simulation program in it where entire environments can be um, simulated and that because it's been a hundred it's been like un it's been eons of time they've been in space that all of the huge amount of people in the ship have turned into different races so that there's the passengers <clears throat> there's the officers and the ship has been you can't go into different sections of it mm. and so the basic premise of it is that finally the the officers who are running the ship are idiots they're morons because they've just evolved with the the ship is just giving them video games to play as simulations of actual things, but really they're doing nothing. The ship runs everything. And finally, one day comes when it says, ding, you know, the arrival planet has been found and you're going to be doing the landing procedure. So first of all, they don't even know if it's a simulation or not is it i mean is it real is this i mean because they can't see anything they all they can see what's projected on the screen which mm. could be made up by the ship so it's about this one officer who actually has self-awareness <clears throat> and he has to go through the depths of the different parts of the ship into the passenger area which is very dangerous uh to to press because the ship is so old and ancient certain certain um, circuitry has been has doesn't work anymore so he has to physically go into the passenger section of this huge ship it's a quest it's a, and he has to activate the landing procedure so that's the essence of the plot of it oh i, I gotta get that well i gotta finish writing it he and i he oh, passed I away you... you know 2005 <clears throat> I thought, oh, I thought this was a, a, a novel that had already been published. No, I have, well, like you, I mean, any creative person, excuse me, you, you and I understand each other, that we have so many projects that are unfinished, you know? So I have to definitely finish that soon. <laughs> okay. Okay, that, that makes total sense then. <laughs> it's called On the Good Ship Mandelbrot, though, after... Uh, the guy who invented fractals, fractal equations. Well, Robert Sheckley uh, got on my radar after George uh, suggested it. I, I said, who's a good science fiction writer who does uh, does comedy? And, and he said, well, you gotta do Robert Sheckley. Oh, those guys were so in tune. I mean, you know, yeah. let's face it, they're both classic. I mean, they're both class classic storytellers. So especially in the 50s, they both shared the, mindset where you know it's it's a penny a, it's a penny a word or two 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 cents a word you know what i mean i mean it was a whole different animal back then yeah 
You know, I, I have to ask you about, uh, this is totally has nothing to do with Satan, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about Brother Theodore, because he seems like somebody who was ahead of his time. And uh, anybody, you can go onto YouTube and, and look him up. And Merv Griffin, he seems like a cool guy because he was he, he was really hip to what Brother Theodore was about. And he, he navigated through, it was, it was this one where Brother Theodore and Jerry Lewis are at each other's necks. I, I think they really were. I think Jerry Lewis was really pissed off. I, I think Jerry Lewis is one of the funniest comedians I've ever seen. I mean, his movies are among the funniest shit I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, so much masterful stuff going on there. Because Brother Theodore was doing was doing a deep dive into his shtick. He created a character that was based on the fact that he, as a child, was a prisoner in fucking Auschwitz. Mm. And all of his family was gassed. So that's mm. the real background of Brother Theodore. <clears throat> and Brother Theodore also was an intellectual genius like Jerry Lewis. He was a chess master. He used to be a chess shark when he... Theodore was saved from the death camps by Albert Einstein, who was oh. in love with Theodore's mother. And so he, had, Einstein had promised his mother that he would look after Theodore, the boy. And so Einstein secretly made these arrangements to get him the hell out, which he did, and had him flown over to New York City and Theodore then became a janitor at Princeton. Wow. And he became a chess shark in uh, Central Park. You know that little subculture of chess? Yeah. This is in New York City. So and he so he would play he would play it dumb. And then he would beat everybody because of that. He played it dumb and then he'd he'd have a games for money. <laughs> and, he would, and he would that was that was his side gig aside from being a janitor at princeton <laughs> and meanwhile wow. he was working as an actor and finally of course had the famous uh midnight show at the 13th street theater in new york city that was attended by everybody i mean bruce j friedman all of the all of the new york the literati went to his shows because he was such an extreme act and <clears throat> Another sidelight is that Merv Griffin was a fantastic guy. Not only okay. was he a superb musician who had the best musicians in the world on his thing, he was like a guy who allowed others to get the laughs. He, Brother Theater was an example of someone like that, who he saw his, his acting and his crazy stand-up performance art. I mean... Theodore was one of the early performance artists. It goes back to Dada, what Theodore was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, to flash forward to my relationship with Brother Theodore, <clears throat> I was like, I don't know, 10 years old maybe. And my mother was watching TV in her room and we started watching the Merv Griffin show. And he said, and now, I'll, uh, Please, please welcome Brother Theodore. And all the lights went out. And, and, and Merv was the first one that put him on TV. And it was black in there, which it never was. And then a harsh spotlight hit the stage at this guy with a, a black turtleneck, black pants, and a crazy look on his face and, and, and crazy gesticulations on a half shock of weird looking whitish hair speaking in a german accent talking about how we're all going to die how life is meaningless and anything i'm saying you shouldn't even be laughing you should just all go home and just huddle in your shelters <laughs> <clears throat> but the end of each section of what he was saying had this pristine fucking punchline much like a stephen wright joke yeah, or someone who does cosmic philosophic one-liners, and so um, Theodore, I saw that, and I, I was so shocked watching it. I, first of all, I, I couldn't even laugh at first, but it was so shocking and weird. And then I was howling. 
I couldn't even breathe. It was the funniest shit I'd ever heard because he was putting on the audience and he was winning them over because the end lines that he would do at the end of these horrific bits that he would do, descriptions of life were so funny and, and canceled out the negativity that he did earlier because they were very self-aware things. And at that moment, I'm telling you, it changed my life. I, I realized then what comedy was and what the value of comedy was. It was where you can free people's minds in your own by, by acknowledging the meaninglessness of life and having a weird positive spin put on it once you do that. And his char character, which was dark and ominous, with, especially with a German voice and everything. And I told you where he came from, where his background was. And he had the power of people like Einstein behind him, <laughs> believing in him, mm. sponsoring him. <laughs> that, I mean, he was up, he was up for the lead role in The Stranger, Orson Welles. And he oh, got wow. fired because he was he started having an affair with Orson Welles' girlfriend. I mean, he just had such a colorful life. Huh. But that was the moment in my childhood when I realized that I wanted to be a comedy writer. You know. Yeah, that that combined with also watching TV with my mother in her her room of the Dick Van Dyke summer show. And he said, and now Andy Kaufman. And this person I don't even know comes out and does a complete put on a, a satire of a comedy act. Yeah. And it was the most I mean, I just was, couldn't breathe. It was the funniest shit ever. And, and it was all deadpan, just like Brother Theodore as if he was really he was doing a satire performing. And that really, those two influences when I was a boy were what made me a, a comedy writer because I was obsessed with it after that. And I ended up having a reputation where I would write for the weird comedians, you know? Yeah, they, they both took it right to the edge and then yeah. maybe beyond the edge. Yeah, I know. And in, in both of their cases, you're right. Wow, and then there's Ernie Kovacs. He's uh, maybe a little bit. Oh my before. God! The, I, I didn't even think of that, but I didn't have his influence until I was an adult. If I'd seen him when I was a boy, that would also have been, because his stuff wasn't. I mean, I, I can't say that Kaufman's thing was personal, but I guess it was because he was making fun of his, himself on stage. But K Kovacs was an intellectual, you know. And his stuff was experimental. He was like an experimental physicist of comedy, you know? He would have things where, I mean, he made this gag up where the camera, he would tilt the camera, have the table made so that it was matching that tilt. And then he just would do bits about, because it looks like things are sliding and going against gravity and all this stuff. It, it, it's just an experiment and fucking with people's heads, mm -hmm. you know? So certainly that was an amazing thing but i didn't know it all about him until much later god i, I was so lucky to, it, uh, i think it was in new orleans our pbs station put on the weirdest stuff uh they put on a, a series called the goodies i don't, I don't oh remember. yeah i know that you sure. remember that one <laughs> it was total absurdist comedy yeah and i remember uh, well that's where i discovered cisco Niebuhr. but so many other people did but Especially Ernie Kovacs. They they ran all uh, the first season or two of the Ernie Kovacs show. And, oh my God, this is hilarious. This is so weird. And I was amazed. Yeah, just like you, I was amazed when I first saw it. I said, Oh my God, this guy was experimenting like that. And it was all different. It was just absurdist stuff. It was so so original, so cool. It was at the same time. Um <clears throat> I'm sorry, I forget. What's the name of the genius guy who did uh, did surreal uh, comedy songs around that same era? Uh, um, I'll think of it later, but there was another guy, Spike Jones. Hmm. So Spike Jones was also of that ilk where it was total experimentation. And yet all four of these people were talking about, uh, Theodore, Kaufman, uh, Kovacs and <clears throat> and Spike Jones all were masters of their craft so they could act like idiots and act like they didn't know what they were doing but they were masters at what they did <laughs> yeah. and that's even made it 10 times funnier 
you know? Yeah, it is, uh, I guess it's a fearlessness and just a... Mm. That's the word. It's the boldness of it. Yeah, you're right. It's the fearlessness of it that was so inspiring. Because I, I hate to even bring it up because I don't want to steal right. the show at all, but I, I, I've been doing my own little stand-up stuff. Not No way. Not, well, in person I did it, and I've I've not done too much on Zoom, but uh, so I, I got a, a, I got to really experience what it's like, and it's just interesting how uh, if you're if you're fear, you're fearless because you've you've uh, got the you've mastered the material, so yeah. it doesn't you don't really have to worry about whether you've memorized it because you've got so many little hooks. I think I think that's yeah. You got so many places you can hook into it. So if you if something else happens, you can improv and then come back to your hook. And it's, well said. It's yeah. fascinating stuff. You know, it's what's really hilarious. This wasn't that many years ago. Was when I right. first it was visiting LA. I stayed at a hostel, and I was such a dumbass. I didn't know about yes and. <laughs> I, I, I meet you. At, at oh, Musso. you mean with, with improv? Yeah, I meet you at Musso. I say, hey, uh, Martin. I, I was talking to this kid at, at the hostel and he was talking about yes and and, and you were so great gracious listening to me like god yeah that's 101 stuff well no i mean that's the, the most important thing <laughs> <laughs> it, it is so that's i mean it isn't 101 it's at the core of improv it's in the core of that type of type of comedy where, where you have to be flexible in in the moment that's the whole point of it that that so many people don't get so unless you learn that and practice it you don't you can't do improv you yeah know? otherwise you'll be doing a bit and you're not working off the other person or the audience you're just doing a bit that's already the whole point is to break down the structures of the mind so that you're fluid yeah <clears throat> but yeah I, 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 that is the greatest shit ever I, I, I gotta see some of your stand-up stuff I, send me a tape if you have any or, or some audio i will I'd love to see it because your artwork your books are the most i mean your books are like dada your books are like amazing <laughs> shit you did, know what i mean you, plus I, your style is so instantly recognizable that's i think you got super strength in that well you're you're very kind thank you for saying <laughs> well i mean ask some that. other people <laughs> because you don't really know your own stuff until you ask other people what they think <laughs> uh, yeah did you get a chance to, to see the book i did on the uh the guy who was from mexico and he he was living in a shell and yeah, of course. Yes. <laughs> and then he goes out and, and he, he does a, he goes on tour and, and he does stand up. And I think if I take the Trump stuff out, it'll have more of a timeless element to it. I, well, I'm that's do, funny. That's what I was thinking. What I think that some of the, one of the things that um, is a great, um, I don't want to use the word selling point, but, but one of the attractive things about your book is that it is an individual who can just say whatever he wants. So there's yeah. that unvarnished commentary, whatever he wants, it's hilarious. And also the, all of that uh, comedy writing, all, all of that, what you've been talking about is, is part of the DNA of this book. Well, I couldn't, before I wrote the first book, the Encyclopedia of Hell book, I mean, it took me 10 years to write that. It took me 10 years to write the <laughs> the conquest of heaven i'm so slow and the first book is basically two thousand jokes i mean it's an encyclopedia that satan wrote about earth with every subject a to z and it was to educate the demon attacking army about mankind because mankind was incomprehensible to demons because they had self-awareness. So uh, in between, I took that book that I wrote because I didn't know how to write jokes. You know what I mean? I had always been interested in comedy, but not in jokes because my guys were brother Theodore, Andy Kaufman, guys that didn't write jokes. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly that's not true strictly at all, but basically their approach was more anarchic and conceptual. Um, so my project was to write I just I wrote like about 3000 jokes and I cut it down to 2000 and that's what this is my lesson my PhD in joke writing I had to learn how to write jokes I was terrible when I first started I would send jokes to Rodney Dangerfield 
and Joan Rivers. And both of them bought jokes from outside people. But with Rodney Dangerfield, it was 10 jokes a page. It was $50 a joke and anybody could send them to him. And he'd look at them because he needs material. And every single time I sent him maybe eight to 10 submissions and always at the bottom, he put, sorry, Marty. Oh. You know? <laughs> so later on, when he, I ended up as, it was on the Penn and Teller show. I was producer of that Penn and Teller show and Rodney was a, a guest. And uh, I said, hey, Rodney, this is so funny, but because I was like one of the main writers on the show. Um, I used to try to sell you jokes when I was a kid. He says, what do you mean? He says, what's your name? And, and then he says, oh, sorry, Marty. <laughs> 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 and we became friends because we were writing together his bits for, the, for this show and stuff. And oh, he was wow. the greatest, by the way. So it's always funny when you have full circle. Yeah. But anyways, uh, that's that's the relationship between joke writing and my writing in terms of this li supposed literary work, uh, because the conquest of heaven, it is not a joke book. It's what happens when Satan goes on a rogue mission to find this mythic God. And if he exists to, to kill him and take over the universe. Yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a futuristic history book, uh, kind of an epistolary with a lot of letters and 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 court <laughs> court documents mm -hmm. and uh old folk tales that have been called eons after the invasion of heaven has been successful and all the angels have been eaten <laughs> <laughs> and where god and satan had the face off which was very interesting because you can't kill god you can't kill satan and it it finally told the joke thing of what their actual relationship was so mm -hmm. that was the that's the core of the conquest of heaven and it's peppered with poems it's peppered with very caustic i was trying to do like a brother theater type thing of showing very nihilistic stuff but with a punchline at the end that would be that would reverse it so so i was trying to present a poetic universe and the ultimate encounter between good and evil and what would actually happen in this in that scenario <clears throat> well that that uh might be a good place to, to end things that it could the books <laughs> are two different animals yeah so you got to have both <laughs> <laughs> no way around well that. there's going to be a third one too because with these two i mean I, it's a matching set but yeah. the third book because I had pitched it as a trilogy because at the third book is where Satan goes to kill God. An, an astounding thing happens because when they, when the demons and Satan and go to, to heaven, they find a secret there. That's just, uh, it's unbelievably, it's too much for even demons to stomach. I mean, it's the a, a <laughs> weird secret at the core of creation about God. And, um, as a result of their of their encounter of their face off satan ends up being ca cast into something called a time void and god also is well i won't tell you what happens but the third book is where the guy who was running satan's army screws up because they're all idiots by the way god demons you and i everybody is a moron we really don't even know why we exist what i mean we don't know even god doesn't know how we got there so <laughs> he just knows that it's all out of his own mind stuff including satan and so um the whole thing is kind of like a sad sack universe that's like a, a shitty carnival with crappy rides that just barely hold together but it looks like with physics and math and everything that everything's pristine perfect you know, the wheel of creation is so perfect. It isn't, it's just barely holding together. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so if you look through the cracks, then you could see the flaws in the universe and in God's limitations, you know? Uh, so anyway, the third book is where de the demon's uh, army, head of his army 
have to go into the time void to find and save Satan. <laughs> and when they go into nothingness, it's like Magellan or uh, that other that other idiot, uh, Columbus, where they um, have to for take their time. It's all time travel, by the way. Yeah, the there's a lot of a lot going on in in this book. Just in these are time travel. travel stories, because Earth, Earth, uh, Hell, Earth, and Heaven all take place on the same orb, the exact same location, but through that evolved through vast eons of time. But they're all accessible through time travel, and also one of the insights is that no no one ever dies. There's no death in the universe because you can always go back and someone is always alive. So uh, it's an adventure of the third book of saving Satan from the nothingness and seeing if it's like Magellan going through the earth, or going across the seas, looking for land. Has the, earth, has, has, has the universe sprouted up again out of the nothingness? And can we then take over that, using time travel, take over that? And attack the, the 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 other earth, the other reality. It's all stuff like that, and jokes where they have to make their crew, and so they can go through time and pick the any any beings that have ever existed. They could take them and make them into their crew, and most of the crews fail. <laughs> but um, I'll talk more about that when I get the third book done. But uh, I'm just so delighted to hear to talk with you again because you and I are old friends. Yeah. I and, uh, I feel that, of thanks course. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it a lot. Oh, you bet. Thank you. And this is the book. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on my website, which is, it's on Amazon, Conquest of Heaven by Martin Olson. And it's um, uh, basically on my website. It's a lot of information about it, which is martin-olson, O-L-S-O-N.com. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll have all that on the, uh, the video and in the text the, the description of the video. We'll, we'll get that covered. Well, thanks, man. It was really fun talking with you. Thanks so much, Martin. Say hi to Jen. I will.